Hi guys, welcome to the last uh, world edition of the third season. So uh, next season will start, it's going to be the fourth one, it will start in September. Uh, check the date, it's not confirmed yet, but it should be mid-September. Um, just, uh, just a little reminder, I, I, I'm asking you, like if you have time, you can go check that out. We have an Instagram, a Facebook, and uh, we have a, also a website. It's drumfieldscafe.com. You can see all the artists we, we got in the interview. Um, it's not just interview. You will see we have a, a, some contests, some other information. We have like article about drumming stuff. So you're more than welcome to go look at it. And we also have shows in French, English, Spanish, and Portuguese, and look at the other one. They're gonna come in uh, in September. Um, so let's go with our first artist of the day. I will go short in the presentation because we have a lot of stuff to talk with. It's a guy from BC, Canada. Uh, his face is known, you will you might have seen him on the channel, not very known as Dromeo. Uh, you're gonna go, um, you will see him, he's a great player. So let's have a chat with him. What's up my friend, <laughs> Dave Atkinson, right. how are you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much, Eric, for having me on here. I am pumped, man. Very cool. Yeah, as I mentioned before we recorded, uh, we started recording, I wanted we talk about you because you're always the guy on the side. You're asking questions. You are talking with the drummer, but we, uh, very rarely you will be, uh, somebody will ask you questions. So I, I wanted to have you as the feature artist today. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, man. That was my pleasure. Hey, um, quick question. Are you from BC originally or you're from uh, other provinces? No, heck no. I I'm born and raised in a small town called Abbotsford, BC. Actually grew up with Jared um, in the same town and we both haven't left. I mean, I live a couple minutes outside of town now, but it's all been in the same area. That's great. Great city, actually. Very close to the border, too. Yeah, you've been there. We brought you to Drumio. Yeah, yeah, yeah three, three years and a half ago, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm very happy to have you here because I want we talk about you. Um, so you, you just mentioned you're born and raised in Abbotsford. You grew up with Jared, too. But you, as a drummer, did you start playing drums? Like, or, or you, your parents like told you, like, no, you should try violin first or flute or stuff like that? Or you, you knew like you wanted to be a drummer right away? Yeah, you know, I my family was always musical, um, but they never really like encouraged go get lessons or go learn this instrument. When I was really, really young, there was a Canadian um, TV guy uh, who did a lot of kids programs called Fred Penner. Okay, yep, yep. I remember Fred Penner being yep. Canadian. Um, and he had a guitar and I just loved it. I wanted to play guitar so bad. And uh, my parents got me one. I mean, they didn't know what they were getting. Um, it was this adult size classical guitar and I didn't know what I was doing with it. So that was my first introduction to music. That's uh, cool. Remembering Fred Penner. Um, but then, you know, I'm not exactly, it's just been so long ago, but um, I believe because I used to go to church when I was young and I used to sit down and watch the worship team play. Yep. And I remember always just being drawn to the music and um, I wanted to participate in some way rather than just be in the congregation. And I remember looking at the guitarist and I was sitting too far away to understand what his fingers were doing. So I'm like, you know what, I'm not going to learn that here. Yeah. Um, and then the piano player was, you know, his hands or her hands were always covered by the piano. So I'm like, I can't figure that out. Same with the piano. <laughs> yeah. But the drummer, the, she, you know, the drummer was a uh, um, this great drummer. Uh, she she played for a lot of years, and I, every time she would play, I just watch her motions. I'm like, I can replicate that. You know, I could do this and I could do that. And you know, I'm tapping on the pew, and the next thing you know, I'm like, you know, maybe I can ask her if I can play on her kit after the service. And that's how it started. Um, and from then, I just grew this weird passion about it. Like there was just something to it. It was a a, a very physical instrument that um, I could see what other drummers are doing. Like their motions are exaggerated. Little did I know there's a lot more. Yeah, about that, but well, it's a yeah. start. It's a good start. It's a good start, right? So uh, that's what got my, my passion going. Um, and then in school, I would I would uh, go to the band room during lunch and play on the kit there. I would ask the band teacher to play after, after school hours. Then I joined the jazz band. I joined concert band. Um, started playing in my church every Sunday. I, I, I was in a couple bands in high school. Um, and uh, Jared was also playing in a, a worship band called Doxa once a Sunday, which I would go to every Sunday, and I would just be mesmerized by his playing. So that's how we connected. And then the, the rest is history, man. It consumed me. Um, I after high school, I just said, I'm just I'm going to be a drummer. That was it. And 
I know a lot of your listeners have said the same thing. I'm sure you did as well at some point. This is just it. And then if you have that passion, it um, takes priority over almost anything else you do. My 20s were practice. Uh, my, you know, my 20s were about 10 years of practice. Wow. You know, and I would just uh, uh, spend time in that practice room and have my practice pad with me. I had like four or five of them around the office or on the office or on the house. No you know, cool. so that's kind of how I did it. But who was your first teacher? Like basically, do, do you have a, who was your first teacher back then? Um, I'm all self-taught. Oh, okay. I took two or three lessons from Jared. He had a couple songs that he played with the with with his band that I just absolutely loved. I wanted to learn them. Um, I took a couple master classes here and there. I went to a couple clinics, um, but I never really had a regular consistent teacher okay. uh, for better or for worse. Well, I don't think there's bad ways. I don't think they have bad path time, like too, because sometimes some people will be self-taught like you just mentioned, like you, and you will learn a lot taking like uh, like things from everybody actually with what, what you do with Dromeo is a bit, a bit like that too. Like people doesn't, some people will need a teacher. Some people, if they don't accessibilities, they can go check good lessons and good teaching approaches online and teach by like learn by their self in their, in their own uh, studio. It's a good oh. way to learn too. I think everyone, like they have their own individual process. I mean, the last 15 years that I've been with Romeo, I've studied a lot of psychology of a student. And you're right, you know, some people could just take it on their own and use that direction to fuel their own or use that motivation to fuel their own practice. And um, others need a little bit more of a kick in the pants. It's the same with um, health, you know. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I need a personal trainer. I don't have the motivation <laughs> to go to the gym, like, uh, like, but I have the motivation to practice, right? right? So, you know, there's there, there, there's different levels of it, and I don't know if it's a it's a passion switch, um, because uh, like I said, if I were to get my butt into the gym, I would prefer to have someone walking me through it, right? So I can see I can see both sides. Yeah, actually, it's it's, it's fun you mentioned that. I was talking with one friend uh, the uh, one friend the other day, and we were talking about like teaching approaches. And he was mentioning me like, yeah, well, now the, the college, university might have rough time for teaching, but not really. It's different. It's completely different business. For example, if you go to McGill the University in Montreal, you're going to learn jazz, but really dig it the all you can play crazy jazz with good teacher, good support. It depends what you want, what are your targets, too. you know, you can have different targets. So I don't think one is better than the other is just different ways so it's good people have those access because back in 1982 for example those drummers if they wanted to go to college it was classical percussions yeah and then have access to like uh, some yes drumming but you will have to go to berkeley college in boston or maybe toronto has one university offering drum set you know what i mean it was very yeah. limited at that time well, and to, and to add, like, I think nowadays in 2021, it is right now, yes. um, information is there. The information is everywhere. And I think mm -hmm. that's the same with not just music, but just in general. Yeah. Um, I think the teachers have to shift their approach. You know, back in 1982, it, all you needed to, to become a teacher was to have more knowledge than the student. <laughs> yeah, <it's so> yeah. true. <laughs> and, uh, but now the information is everywhere. So a teacher's yeah. real role is to try and find that motivation switch, like I mentioned before, to get the students to want to consume that information and apply it. You know, of course, you, you guide them, but sometimes you have to do things that would traditionally be frowned upon mm -hmm. um, for the end goal, which is to make sure that that student actually wants to practice, actually prioritizes finding that information, consuming it, and actually using that information to better themselves as a drummer. Oh, yeah. um, so things have completely shifted, as, as you mentioned, and I think that's more relevant today than ever, especially with online teaching, uh, private teaching, and everything. It's just a completely different approach. Just switching to like a bit like educational to what you are playing. For example, mm. uh, when you were starting, you played drums, you play in a bands, you have a few bands. Um, do you still have a band? Like, I mean, do you, well, I mean, COVID is complicated, but are you still playing drum in a band like in Abbotsford or you're more like only like online stuff right now? Um, so, yeah, I, I've had bands my whole life. I don't think I ever want to stop playing in a band. Okay. That's what, the, you know, that's what the payout is for me, you know, yep. um, is getting on stage, sharing music and uh, performing. But um, I did have a serious band I was with. The, they were called the Yuka. I was okay. with them for about eight and a half to nine years, and uh, we had a small cool. amount of success. You know, we were able to go and tour the world a little bit. We went to Japan a few times, went our cool. overseas out to 
uh, down to down to the U U.S. and all over the place. Um, we had some songs spun on the radio. It was a fun experience. I really enjoyed it. Um, so like, cool. And um, you know this, you know the lead singer started having a you know, family, and so did the bass player. You know, so so that one has been put on indefinite hold. I think that's what they call it now in bands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's we're on a what do you, what what is what's the term? Hiatus. Yeah, hiatus. I think so. <laughs> but my well, because my, my connection was you have a band, you have you were talking about educational, like a good mix. Like I mean, now I think it's uh, experiences too. When you have a good person, because you just just said I tour the world, I think that's have a lot of values too. When you have a student in front of you, you you, you can have a lot of acknowledge like you can play very well the drum but you have also experience in your in your back you know and i'm sure when you talk with those kids um they're gonna learn so much because when you go on tour there's million of things you cannot explain you, you have to live those things you know what i mean you can be prepared but if you don't live those you you cannot understand 100 percent oh and you know to that to that extent like touring isn't for everyone um, <laughs> a fantastic drummer and he had many opportunities to go on the road with bands and um he did a few times in fact i picked up a couple of the gigs that he just didn't like touring um um because he realized that you know what he really enjoys is being home with his family and you know not being on the road um so i mean that's one thing that you think when you're young i just want to be a drummer i want to be a drummer whatever that means you get on the road and it might not be your cup of tea i personally loved it I would go on the road tomorrow um, if I could. I think it's a lot of fun. It's fun. Um, but uh, yeah, the grass is always greener, like they always say, right? Always. But actually, what was one, uh, can you tell us like a one, uh, one of one of, uh, of two experiences, like uh, very funny or very cool you have to live when you were on tour, like something you remember, like oh, that was a good, like a cool day or cool show or something happened on tour, one or two if you have it in mind. Yeah, well, I mean, first off, when you go, we went we, to Japan, we've been there a few times. Um, for some reason, they just really dug our music. But, <laughs> okay. Just in general, um, going over halfway across the world to a country where they don't even speak your language, yes, I mean, yeah. on stage and playing your music and then watching them sing the words, they don't know <laughs> what they're singing. <laughs> yeah. But they just loved it, you know? That, uh -huh. Experience. It's not a single one show that had that. Majority of the shows did, and that I never really um, got over that. I'm like, this, this is just really, really cool. It's amazing to see. Um, but you name it, man. Like there is experiences where like we were billeting in this one house, and a guy just outside of Tokyo, and um, just being in a hotel is one thing, but when you're actually in a house of a local, this yeah, guy, that's something. Yeah. <laughs> that experience, like he had like this massive, um, not, was it backgammon? I think it was backgammon, this backgammon board. Um, or oh, no, 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 not backgammon. I'm saying the wrong one. It was, I can't even remember what it is. Uh, it's like a, almost like dominoes, but a Japanese. Oh yeah. Game. The Japanese. No, yeah. Not bad game. And the, I know what the other one is. Yeah. It's cute. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Know, I was, don't know the name, but I know what you're talking about. It was this massive table that probably cost him like five or six grand and it was all automated. It would shuffle the, the and I'm just sitting there looking at, looking at like everything around the house and just getting to know the culture of what they, how they live and like what, uh, what their priorities are, what do they have on? Like I have a big TV in my, in my house. So they don't. Right. So they, like just yeah. getting to actually experience the culture um, was really cool. And then that very, that very show I get there and the guy's, Oh yeah, I've got a kit for you. I've got all this backline for you. And I get there, and of course the nightmare happens where the, the snare drum stand is not working. Can't even keep the snare up. All okay. the smoke, half of them are broken, you know, and I'm like, I gotta make this work, right? So um yeah, and then asking, hey, where can I find a local music store to go buy a snare cool. drum stand? You know, things like that happen. And then um, um, you know, in a different country where you don't speak the language is quite an experience. Actually, uh, my question, my next question was like, are you a gear freak when you go on tour? Maybe you are. That's that's another topic. We'll talk about that after. But on tour, are you the kind of princess you need? I want my 14 by six and a half maple, whatever. Or they like, I don't care. I will play with what I what they have there. What kind of guy no. you are with that? No, you know, from the very beginning when I started playing local shows, I remember really despising drummers that were playing after me or before me and how how particular they were um and the poor sound man like uh, uh, the whole running joke is sound men are the, are the worst because yeah. they deal with drummers right but um you know i i really started despising that and i wanted to make sure i always found that the sound or the bands that played that had the least 
fighting with the sound men, they always sounded the best because he's happier. He's like, oh yeah, these guys yeah. are going to make yeah. them good. So I started to try and use that approach with every show I played. You know, I was a chameleon. I would play any kit that was there as long as I could kind of jerry rig it to, to match my style. And as long as I can make it sound decent, like even my sound check, like a kick and snare, if I can hear those and and uh, like vocals or whatever, I'm good. Um, so yeah, no, I'm not really a, a gear snob. There was an era in my life where, of course, you know, a new symbol, I've got to try it, i got to hear it. And I had pictures in my folder of like my dream kits and, you know, <laughs> You know, when Facebook shows a memory, yeah. you know, just the other day I had one of this acrylic kit that I'm like, oh, one of these days this is going to be mine. And and, and <laughs> I, I did have that era. But, um, you know, with Drumio, Drumio now, I'm, I'm very spoiled. Um, and we have a backline of around 80 kits. Yeah, it's um, crazy. And, um, yeah, we have, we have new symbols and gears shipped to us so we can test out. So I'm very spoiled and I'm very blessed for that um, to the point where, as like, uh, to me, gear doesn't mean anything anymore. Yeah. Yeah, but it's good because at the same time, you maybe you have one piece of you say that's that's a snare I like. I'm, I'm, it's my favorite. It's back home when I do shows. But after that, you don't need to buy all the drums as you can just to feel full yourself. You know, you will you will get if you need it, and that's it. It's a, I think it's an age. I think that's a part of the age. like. I think in your life you pass that. Yeah. And for me, the other day, I one guy asked me which snare you will tour with all the time you can if you need only one snare and i have one only one so that snare is my favorite and i only have one i have a lot more collection kind of thing but but for me if you ask me only one i will tour with one model and it's different i have for instance get their guitar player it's the same they have like one guitar it's like yeah i have 20 but i have one is my go uh, go guitar every day you know what i mean what is that what is that snare you got me curious now uh it's a it's a dw 10 aluminum 14 by six and a half the reason is because i did around 500 shows with it i know exactly what that's that snare can give me so yeah. if i if i put it up it's very it can be poppy i can if i drop it it's very like low the aluminum is very warm but i will say something it's not just about the brand i tried the yamaha i tried the donut i try and when they are in aluminum they sing as for me i mean it's different taste for everybody but i yeah. like that kind of sh warm those kind of shell gave me you know what i mean totally oh that's cool I, when you're saying you got your favorite snare want to know what it is yeah very good yeah. it's just a, just a like something like i think kids it's good you say that because i really think um kids should invest maybe in one good set but after that, their money after that, in educational stuff uh to grow as a person and and bring like things around them because even if you have 20 kids if you don't use them it doesn't work it okay. so uh, yeah i think it's it's, it's uh, it doesn't uh, make sense uh the time goes fast we have around five minutes man um yeah Seriously? Yeah, it's 25 minutes around. So like, let's six, seven minutes. Um, yeah, sorry. I know I asked you about drumming, dr drum geek. You said at Drumio, you have a, a lot of stuff it's changing to Drumio. Uh, um, before Drumio, when it started all that thing, um, I not, I'm sure you didn't expect it's going to become so big as like, like you just mentioned me before, like you have guitar, bass, keyboard, singing, other, like other branches of Drumio. And I'm sure you didn't expect Drumio will become that big too. Uh, I'm sure you have big expectation, but it became very big. So um, so how you you started all that at first, like the first year, because I know in tw 2002, 2003, you started all that thing, but when it become the brand, um, how you, brand, you bring up all those ideas uh, together? But well, my question was, is it, because I have the book, is it the drumming system uh, bring all that together or it was before that 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 that, uh, that concept. No, there was a couple phases of, and for your listeners out there who don't know, before we were Drumio, we were called Railroad Media. Mm -hmm. We've really been Drumio for about eight or nine years now. Um, and uh, but before that, like there was a couple phases. Like there were one of them that really uh, um, shook the drumming community up and um, really put us on the map a little bit was uh, a website called FreeDrumLessons.com. Yep. And um, this was back in 2007. So you got to remember, like YouTube was yep. since its infancy. And um, there was a the couple websites out there for drummers, like Drummer World was going at the time, Drum Bum, um, you know, a couple others out there that, uh, that, that were, you know, trying to make a living online with drum education. So then when we came out with freedrumlessons.com, it shook the world up. And we got a lot of hate for that from these companies. <laughs> We're trying to say, say make money here, and then you're trying to give it away for free. Um, that was that was the first phase. Um, we went into DVD packs, obviously. Um, 
which definitely had uh, uh, some impact. Like we were able to grow the team a little bit there. Um, but it wasn't until we decided that, um, um, you know, this is in 2011 and we were making a decision, do we go with the pack method where we're creating these like drumming system is like a 20 DVD pack set. Yes, yeah, it's big. Yeah, it's like it's huge, right? Um, but we saw the death of DVD and physical media at that stage. We saw the acceptance of these online communities through Facebook, through Instagram, through Twitter um, that were really gaining momentum. So we decided to shift to an online version of education like what we have in Drumio. And we were actually one of the first companies to be streaming um, on the Internet. Um, mm -hmm. I, I remember we had companies emailing us from random different markets, not even music, just saying, hey, I noticed that you guys are streaming and you have people chatting with you. Like, how do you do that? Right. <laughs> so, yeah. that, so that was the that was the third phase. So you got like the free drum lesson era. You have the drum DVD pack era and then you have the Drumio era, which is online. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's a good achievement. Um, I didn't go to Nam Show the last year when it was there, but I've seen the, the boot you you <laughs> built together was pretty huge. I saw you the the, the two years before. Uh, it was a smaller boot with the sofa and all the the cozy kind of uh, thing. It was pretty cool. And um, and I saw your evolution. And every day you have like every day you have content. Every week you have good content. Actually, I was watching one of your video. The uh, play one song with like a five different uh, patterns, you know, like a different approach. This is what I wanted to talk about, but not about Dromeo, about you. Uh, when you approach with one band or one singer, okay, if you sub someone or even if you start to create, what kind of guy you are? If, if the guitar like send you a track or uh, what kind of player are you? Are you going to jump in like, like just the, 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 to play the song from A to B? Are you going to try to uh, redo what another drummer have done before? Like how you approach a song when you, as a drummer, you play those songs? Oh, that's a, that's a really big question. Um, Cause it really depends on the, on, on why I'm playing the song in the first place, you know? For sure. Yep. Um, you know, if I'm, in, if I'm in practice studio, I'm obviously just pushing myself, trying to, try, trying to see what it is that, um, what exercise I can pull from a song or, or, or whatever it is. Um, if I'm like, on a recording gig where someone's given giving me a song to play, you know, obviously I'm really receptive to what the producer and the songwriter want from it. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm, I'm in, if I'm in a jam band, or if I'm going to play with another musician, it's actually all communication, yep. musical communication, right? Like I just I try to be as open to listening to what they're doing. What do I do that makes them react, and what kind of things should I be reacting to what they're doing? Um, and it really goes from there. And each guitarist has some has a different, you know, personality. As you know, like it's like yep. play, playing with live musicians. It's it's really hard to say what is your go to. Well, I don't have a go to. You have to have the open ear, and um, create something together. That's kind of the way I try to uh, approach it. You know, really from a musical standpoint, and not from a drummer standpoint. If that makes sense. Yeah, it's good. I was asking that just because it's always. I always like to learn from other person, and uh, and for me, I as a session guy, um, every songs are different. You know, like everybody are different. And you just said something so right, and people need to get, to catch that uh, sentence. It's like you need to go with communication. I'm a musician, and when I'm on a gig, my eyes are are working more than my ears. I I know when they put their fingers on on the chords or in the piano or on the bass. I know exactly where they go and I have a background as a, I play piano, I played violin. Uh, so I can know like maybe eight, 10, 15, maybe a full section in advance where they will go because I know what kind of chords they are doing. So I'm suggesting the drummer, don't be just stuck on your drumming. Like think about the guitar player and try to put yourself in their uh, shoes for, you know, where they want to go with that. And that will make you a bigger, com uh, better communication, sorry, uh, with them. Give me one sec. I got something to add. Uh, it's a communication, head. dog. <laughs> it's okay. There's no problem with that. So what but, I want uh, to add to that um, is the biggest problem I see from, and, and I, we're part to blame to this, Eric, is that drummers always think of themselves as drummers. They always practice to be a better drummer. Oh, yeah, this is true. Faster speed, better chops. Mm -hmm. uh, Almost like they're putting the Olympics into their into their practice, <laughs> uh, and uh, they don't practice to be musicians, and they mm. should. You know, I, you know the old adage: How do I play solos? Drum solos are so hard for drummers. 
Um, I always say, hey, can you beatbox something that's interesting for 30 seconds? You know, can you can you sing me a song that mm -hmm. you created in your head? You know, and most of the time they can't do that. It's, it, and, and it goes to my point where stop practicing to become a drummer. Totally, totally. Become a musician. Yeah, one exercise I always give to my students is I, I'm asking them to buy the fake book, the jazz fake book, and I will book, I will take like let, let's say like straight note chaser, and I will I will tell them play the the, the jazz right on the the hi hat on two and four, sing the bass. After okay. that, when you're good, play the bass with your bass drum and sing the the theme of the song. And if you're good at it, let's switch that the same theme but in samba or in in uh, whatever style. So it's and I'm doing that with a lot of my students playing the fake book. And when they're done. Let's go with uh, uh, like uh, rhythm and blues and uh, and like uh, country music. And I'm trying to make him them sing during they play the backbeat, for they can have a better uh, understanding of where to put the bass drum and uh, and all. So that's uh, that's something I think I'm sure you did it by the past anyway. So yeah, have to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, no, sorry, go ahead. No, sorry, go ahead. When he taught students, he used to um, ask them to tell them about their weekend while they're playing the beat. And totally. if they're able to do that, then they completely internalize that beat and can play it because you got to be able to multitask right yeah no but this is a this is a good point and uh, i really like the video you did for the five different version uh of playing drums because i was doing that with my 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 student like 20 years ago uh with dave were called books and yeah. like this play along volume one volume two but i was always writing a different way to play those songs so they were like ah, that's an easy song at that well wait well i will write something harder you will see later you yeah. will uh, you will you will think about your mom for sure but it's a uh, it's something <laughs> you know <laughs> it's something important yeah um hey but dave it's all it, we're done but you're a super cool guy uh i really um I really suggest to everybody to go watch your show. You're a super good host too. Uh, I watch a lot of your shows and I really uh, say to all the audience, go check Dromeo, but go, go check you. And by the way, I wanted to say, I checked really you're playing the other day. You have a good backbeat, man. I, I, you have a really solid backbeat. I really like that. No, it's, not, it's not just for giving you flowers, but I mean, you're really, you're, you have a good backbeat and uh, keep that. That's one of the best compliments I think you could give a drummer. Yeah, no, but sometimes some some like no, I, I want to play faster. But you know, you you is the, the your backbeat was uh, really cool and uh, keep keep doing that. So hey man, I hope to see you soon. I'm not in Canada right now. I might back to Canada, like, I mean in April or May. But uh, well, uh, before that, uh, well, I wish you uh, good luck, stay safe, and let's try to keep in touch, my friend. Hundred percent. Thank you so much for having me on here, Eric, and to all the listeners watching Trump Hills Cafe. Thank you. <laughs> 30 minutes chatting with me and uh, yeah, come check out Drumio. Come see what we do there and uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Awesome. I see you, buddy. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care. Thanks for Dave Atkinson. I really suggest you to go to Drumio, million of content. If you uh, didn't know, they have uh, like a few video free, but there's a lot of, uh, you should subscribe. It's not expensive and you have access to million of stuff. So see you. Uh, Hi, everybody. So, um, Little reminder, please, uh, if you have time, go check out the website, uh, drumfieldcafe.com. We have uh, so many information there right now. All the artists uh, we had on the show, by the way, we're in the third season. Somebody, so a lot of people didn't know, so we had two seasons before that one. A lot of artists. Don't be surprised. We have a French show. We have one in Spanish, too. So, And we have the world edition. It's basically in English. So it depends if you speak only one language. English will be the world edition. But if you have those other languages in your pocket, French or Spanish, you can al always go check that out. Um, we also have like a editorial and article. So you're welcome to go read them. Uh, they're managed by Frank Camus mostly. He's the chief editor of the, of the platform. And um, if you have any question, feel free to write to us directly. Uh, one of the, it can be me, can be someone from the team who's gonna answer your question, whatever you have suggestion for the next season. Next season might start mid-September. So uh, check out the date. Uh, it's not confirmed yet, but 100%, but you might have all the information on the Facebook, Instagram, the YouTube, or that page of uh, the .com from Drumfield Cafe. Um, second artist, it's a great drummer actually. Um, Oh, they are all great, but this guy is a super good player. Uh, he started to play at six years old. He's a teacher, session, sound engineer, clinician. Uh, he, he's, he played and he still played with a very famous band, the Crashes Dummies. Um, 
He's, uh, he's been running for four years uh, a drum camp with Drum Family Aru in Germany. And for around that 10 years, like uh, Rick Gratton's, like jump with them, we'll talk about that too. Uh, they reached around 250,000 students during 10 years. It's a lot. Um, he played uh, in the Montreal Drum Fest. He has, like, he featured in many, like, uh, drums magazine, like Drum and Chichara and others. And he, we're going to talk about his documentary too. And he's a Sabian, Pearl, Remo, and Vic First, and Dorsey. Let's welcome Mitch Dorch. How are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Have I my coffee. It's afternoon today. for you there, isn't it? Uh, right now it's uh, it's eleven fifteen. Eleven okay. nineteen. Okay. Almost the time with uh, because I'm not in Montreal. I'm in Mexico City. That's the thing. Oh well. Okay. Yep. So that's why I have a place here. <laughs> So COVID, like with COVID, snow, I, try, I'm try, I was trying to avoid that. So I, I'm in the condo here. It's easier yeah. for me. <laughs> Smart man. Yes. Well, welcome. And thanks for being on Drum Fields Cafe. Like I told you just before the recording, uh, I'm very happy to have you because you're a great Canadian drummer name. You're, you have you build your name in the industry with bands, with sessions, uh, teaching too. And I think it's cool. We had, you can talk. You can talk about your experience on uh, DFK. Uh, fire away! <laughs> I want to give you all the experiences that I can. I'm super <laughs> honored that you should even ask me to be here. Well, uh, it's very cool. So, well, first of all, I uh, when I, re I read your bio, I knew you. Just to let you know, I saw you with your band Crashes Dummies. I saw you in the Montreal Drum Fest, and. I, I, I was always like a listening of your music like during those years. Uh, I'm younger, younger than you, but I'm, I really like history and like drummer, Canadian history. So for me, you were part of that, uh, that, that league. And um, I, wonder, I didn't know you started at six years old. That's a young age to start drum. Who, who introduced you with drumming? Well, I, you know, it's the story that I believe that you hear from most drummers. And when I was a child, I was that kid that when you went to a restaurant, I was the kid with the fork and knife playing on, on, on plates and playing on tables and, and pots and pans, you know, constant about pots and pans, the, 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 the uh, headrest behind my dad in the car, uh, <laughs> you know, every, everything to me, I was always experiencing rhythms. And mm -hmm. uh, when I was six years old, my sister was a piano player and, and uh, my dad simply just came over and said, you know what, I think it's time for you to, to, to play an instrument. Your sister's taking piano lessons. What, what instrument would you like to play? I thought it was pretty obvious, but I was only six. So, uh, you know, drums was the natural natural thing to go. So he made me a deal. Uh, he said that if, if I will get you a set of drums, uh, but you have to take lessons. Uh, if you don't take lessons, then then no drums. So, of course, we got our, our first, like everybody else, I got my, my first set of drums. So they were, uh, I think they were Raven Red Spark. <laughs> uh, I only had a bass drum, a snare drum, and I think a floor tom. That's all that I had. That's perfect. And, uh, and but it, for me, it was the greatest thing in the world. For sure. And um, my cousin, uh, Raymond, came over and, and he knew how to play, for whatever reason, he knew how to play that opening drum fill from Hawaii Five-0. Uh, you know, yeah. So, so he knew how to play that. So I, I immediately wanted to play that. Now, unfortunately, uh, in in particular in those days, because we're talking about the early '60s here, uh, teaching was very much uh, academic, okay. and uh, so whenever I went for my drum lessons, it was about uh, single stroke roll, double stroke roll, mama dada, right dada, dada, mama dada, and, 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 and to be able to function as a musician really wasn't in the vocabulary of teachers back then. And uh, so I, I found this very dry. I found it very uninspiring. And I, I managed to go maybe four or five months before I, I, I wanted to quit lessons. Oh, yeah. My dad uh, said, remember, I told you that was this was our deal. No lessons, no drums. No drums. So I called him on it. I quit my lessons, and all of a sudden, the drums disappeared again. Okay. So uh, with, with, uh, with me being persistent and everything else, the, the good thing that happened is I said, you know, maybe, maybe if we found a different place to learn how to play or if I found a different teacher, can we try that? So it took a little while, but the drums came back, and we found a different teacher. This teacher, uh, I wish I could remember his name, but he was inspiring because Every time I would come in, he would say, "What do you want to play?" And and uh, and I'd say, "Wow, I, let's do it, Mama Dada, Mama Dada." They would, you know, and he said, "No, no, let's 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 figure out what you want to play." 
and then we'll 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 learn that and then we'll keep going from there where he really run me uh, won me over was that he had an old zin symbol in his trunk that he had okay. that he had to use as uh, held his spare tire in in his trunk <laughs> and uh, and he, he just he liked me for whatever reason and he gave me that symbol and so for so me cool. I wanted to do anything that I could to please him. And so he'd get yeah, yeah. some exercises. I'd go home and I'd practice those exercises because I just, he was so nice to me. So he inspired me to, 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 to play. So now here I am, I'm seven years old or seven and a half years old. And I, and I'm inspired to play. I'm, I'm not just taking lessons because I have to, uh, I'm taking lessons because I want to, right? This guy is, is, is putting something in my head that I really want to play. So, I mean, I, you know, I did that, uh, like every other drummer, I, I did that for the next, you know, four or five years before I started playing in, in bands with my friends. So six years old was was a was it was a great time for me to start uh, because I was I, a little bit of a loner kind of a kid, and okay. uh, so so being at home and playing drums was 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 amazing. It was an I, w I would never say that it was an outlet, uh, but I would say that it was a creative outlet for me. Uh, it was just to be able to sit down and, and try to create new rhythms. I mean, I don't know what you create at six years old, but no, but I was heavily in pursuit of being able to play that opening for Hawaii Five O. You said something so so right for kids listening or teenagers. You you just or even whatever person at whatever ages. You just mentioned uh, I was kind of loner and I, I jumped into music and I played music. Music is a very good uh, thing. Uh, whatever, like uh, it's a good hobby and um, it's creative. And if one day you don't want to be technical on your practicing, you can go musical, you can mix both. You can, you know, it's it's like making doing sport. You know, I really encourage schools to push those things. Uh, what depend on who you are and that's going to build your personality uh, with it, whatever instruments too you're going to play. Well, ab absolutely. I mean, I mean, it's, it's it's funny you should pick up on that. You know, my whole teaching style, my entire life on on everything that I've ever done is to try uh, to inspire the, the personality of mm -hmm. the person who's playing. And, and uh, so as, as an example, uh, when we were in Germany, so, you know, Don Familaro would be in one room and then I was in the other room. And uh, we, we, were, we were both working on creating human beings, uh, not so much musicians, but creating human beings. And mm -hmm. what we would do is we would try to, to, to give our students something uh, – that reflected part of themselves. You know, they, they could Probably. say, well, you know, they, like I, everybody can play paradiddles. Everybody can do all these kinds of things, but it's, it's how you play it. It's how you interpret it. It's how it becomes. And, and when you, and when you play something and you, you you put a big smile on your face, then you're, you're inspired to, to go further. <clears throat> and and uh, that just gives you like a, a, a joie de vivre, you know, to, uh -huh. to really get out there. And, uh, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. If, if schools, could, could be just a little less academic about teaching of music and more about how music can be part of their creative lives. Totally. Uh, such a big difference. Yeah, I know because when I was a kid, I did the path like you. Like uh, I started at three years old and my I got my first lesson at five. But after I did, you know, like, uh, like kindergarten, middle school, high school, all those steps, college, university in, in drums. And and it's the drum fact the I mean the teacher factor is important and uh, depend on who was guiding me and but another thing sometime when I was in high school I remember I had that competition crazy because I was in the uh, big band and uh, stage band and the harmony for competition super academics like like this but I find a way to have a drum teacher outside of school and he taught me like say Rick you should have a band outside. And I will help you to 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 make it happen. And I remember I was playing first song, you know, Beatles, Led Zepp, stuff like that, like very basic song. And that made me that side of musicality, and that built me. But sometimes people at the beginning, I was the black sheep. Uh, for when I arrived to college, it was so funny. I was a punk rocker, and uh, and I was playing jazz too because my I grew up with Body Rich and Deep Purple and those bands. But at the same time, I I, I really dig like those bands, like punk rock, hardcore metal. And I remember those guys were like, that's not academic. No, but it's, and yes, it's a big mix of both. And that built a personality. That's why it's very good, the point you mentioned. And Dom, Dom Famero is a good guy to work those things. Uh, he's a super good teacher for that. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, I, I found that in, in my time, 
uh, I, I've had the really wonderful fortune of being able to hang out with some of my idols in, in, in my time. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. you, know, uh, you know, myself and Billy Cobham have become uh, really good friends over the wow. years. Uh, we rarely ever, ever talk drums. For it's, sure. It's, it's, <laughs> we, we've spent the whole day together. We, we're both squash players. And, and uh, so we would be in Los Angeles. And we'd both be, we'd go, get up in the morning. We'd go have some breakfast then we'd go play some squash then we'd come back and we'd have some lunch and we'd talk about life and and uh you, you know after spending some time with them uh so i mean it was like that with with uh, with terry bazio it was like that with don famularo it's like that with rick gratton it's like that with uh, mark kelso uh mm -hmm. all these you you spend some time with them and then you realize you go okay this is this is why you sound the way you sound this is why you play the way you play this is why uh, people want you to be involved with their projects it's because of what it's it's not your it's not the academics that you bring, uh, although they're, they're there, uh, but it's the personality. It's it's this thing that you bring in this this creative vibe uh, that, that you bring totally. into the room with you that 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 makes you who you are. That's you know because very often we, for me, it's always been the kind of thing where I, I see someone, and I go wow like that is, that is that is really great the way that that the way that they phrased it or or just the the way that they sit on the time. And then you talk to them afterwards and you go, ah, nah, I get it. I, I, <laughs> you know, yep. so like something somewhere has pushed your personality uh, to, to, to express yourself the way that you do. And, and, and Dom, again, I, I want to, uh, but Dom's a great one for that, right? I mean, if you spend some time with Dom and then you see him yep. behind the kit, you go, yeah, 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 I get it now. Yeah, yeah, he's a great guy. By the way, when you did the drum fest, I remember I was in the room and something I really like about what you did at that time, you took the stage even before you played. You just came in and your buddy was breathing. What are you going to do? And I, I remember you have a weird symbol, like a Sabian, like a kind of spiral or something weird. And you start playing like textures. And this was really cool because you really build that thing like we build a conversation it was not just i'm gonna vomit a drum solo for like one hour and a half you know you arrive and you create a, an environment it was you and this I, I think was cool and i compare that when when you play with your band you're not it, it's your personality but now you're a backbeat guy and you do your stuff so it's it's super nice the way you mix that um well it's only for i only i only wanted to mention that so but i really like the way you Take a stage, in general. Oh, well, thank you. I, I think as I'm, the the fact that you even picked up on that is is uh, is, a, is a compliment and the highest honor. Uh, yep. think, they're called spimbles, by the way. Okay, yeah, I didn't. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, it was it was really weird because uh, because of the someone had taken. I think it was um, uh, Marco Sarcoli. Yeah, Marco Sarcoli. Uh, he took a picture of of the drum kit uh, from Montreal Drum Festival. And uh, so Billy Cobham was coming to Winnipeg to do a clinic. And he okay. called me up and he said, hey, man, I, I want to play one of your little spimbles that you have, one of those spirally <laughs> things. Have you got one that I can borrow for this clinic? And, and, and uh, you know, and it was a great, I, I think those kinds of things, because you, you just can't smash them. No, uh, no. I, I think they, they, they make you evoke uh, mm -hmm. emotion because you, you have to approach it like an instrument. You, you just can't bash it. Uh, and by the way, to go back, I really love that vomit a drum solo. <laughs> no. And that's, you know what, I mean, it's, it, 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 I, I call it, uh, I call it being a drum diva sometimes, it's, <laughs> you know, because we, we get out and, and, and uh, I, I think we're all guilty of it. We, we've all yep. sat down and said, you know, here's everything I know. Uh, but. Yeah, to the vomit, the drum solo. That's it. I got to keep that in my vocabulary. <laughs> because I'm, I'm mentioning that because I did a few drum clinics uh, with Long and McQuay the past, uh, the, just before COVID. And I, I'm i not in the state of mind right now, the mood to do drum solo. I like to play stuff in the song. But uh, a lot of people, can you do a drum solo? Uh, every time, like, uh, I don't. I will check about that. So I always do, but it's not something now it talked to me so recently, I was back to Tony Williams because it was a great influence to me. And now I learned back what is a drum solo, how you can build it. So great. One hour drum solo, but it's so good on the way. It, uh, it captives the audience and it's not just like chops. It's vocabulary, color. And I think this is something kids should work more uh, for, for developing drum solos. It's hard. It's not easy to do that. Well, I think it's. I think it should be a prerequisite for every drummer to sit down 
and uh, listen to uh, Four and More mm-hmm. uh, from Miles Davis. I mean, the, Tony Williams was 17 when they when they recorded. I know. <laughs> and uh, you know what? And 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 you listen to it, and you go, there. At no point uh, is there chops in in this in this music. There's no chops here at all. This is strictly expression. It's, this this so cool. you know, and and I, that should be a pre- prerequisite, I think, for for every drummer is to. Because what happens is that through time, uh, we forget. When I talk to kids today, uh, they don't know who Tony Williams is. They don't know who uh, um, Art Blakey. They don't know yes. who Art Blakey is. They don't know who Lenny White is. Uh, all these people from my past, they don't know who they are. And I, and I think that, that you know, that's the kind of thing where we need to take them and say, here, take this home, listen to this. And this has nothing to do with chops. This, this is all about, all about music. Uh, and and Tony, but you know, just just because you uh, you have a lot of room to play uh, with Cirque du Soleil, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, right? Okay, right. There, there, you, there's a lot of you're not just holding the backbeat through the whole thing. It depends on the gig. Of- I would say depend on the gigs. With, with for example, with Cavalia, with Odysseo, the show I was in Winnipeg, I I created the the drum patterns. Michel Cusson, the guitar player, uh, was telling me, for example, okay. Um, this is the chart. I want a punch there. That's the groove, the idea of what it is. And I'm giving you a freedom. But at the moment the, the songs are written, it, it's what it is. But we have open sections. So when something happens, we, we, we're, we're going to roll a, 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 B, a, C, or whatever pattern it is. Um, but with other shows, it's, it's, it's really a square. Like uh, you, have, you cannot go off road. So it depends of the production and the show. I did a lot, so I don't know. It depends. It really depends. Yeah, but I, I've seen enough search shows uh, th- to know that uh, as a rhythm section, periodically, uh, mm-hmm. you've got room to, to play. But we have room to play. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you agree with that. Yeah. By the way, I'm jealous. Uh, Michel Cusson is one of, one of my favorite guitar players. Uh, yeah, I worked with him forever. <laughs> oh, uh, you know, back, back in the day of uh, Uzeb. Yep. Uh, I think it's uh, 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 Rue Lambaugh, I think. Uh-huh. Uh, wow. he, he just he just nails it uh on there and uh, paul brochure another uh, great guy paul on the show uh no not yet but he's a good friend of mine actually he was my teacher for one year in university so and we we we, we talk sometime but he's, he might come one day uh yep yeah. it's it's so so limited now the number of person we can have but uh yes he's on the list too he, uh, he might come one day, but it's just funny. Michel is an expressive guy, and uh, and I was talking with him last week actually, and it's very funny. The first time he called me was in nine, uh, no, in two thousand. It's been twenty years, and when he called me, super stressed guy. So uh, now he calmed down, but back in back then, and he's like, "Hey, uh, it's Michel Cusson, I'm a guitar player, you know." Uh, I was like, "Yeah, I, I know you." It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, "Yeah, you you can play drum fast." Yeah, yeah, I can play drum fast. Okay, perfect. I have a gig for you. So he he, he hired me for a, a soundtrack for uh, the last chapter on CBC a TV program. Uh, so I I did uh, all, uh, a lot of drum for that TV program for uh, CBC, and after that, he hired me for other gigs. But the way he talk. It's the way he play. He's very like energetic person. Like, so now he calmed down. So it's 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 very, it's very funny when we talk about that. Like back in the days, and now he's playing. But it's a good example too. We grew up as a person. So when we are kids, we have different energy, and when we're getting older, so we express that to our instruments. I I, I believe. Yeah, I, I'm I'm right there with you. <laughs> and the time flies to pass for about five, six, seven minutes. I want we talk about just a few things before we go. Um, you did a few documentary. It's so cool. This I didn't know. Sorry, I I, I knew stuff about you, but not all. And tell tell us about why you start when you decided. Okay, I'm gonna do a documentary about what I'm thinking and my perspective and all those things. How how that started? Uh, well, it 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 actually started uh, with me. Um, I, I did this thing called um, in, in Your Face and Interactive. Yeah, and, uh, and I and I really, um, I wasn't sure whether that was going to be a documentary or if it was going to be uh, a, a, a drum video. Okay. And, uh, and uh, honestly, at the time, I was quite confused about which way it should go. Okay. I, I had seen so many drum videos and, and, and so people would say, well, why don't you do a drum video like this? And it, and I, well, how many drum videos do we need where I say, you know, here's a backbeat and then uh, <laughs> you know, here's, 
here's uh you know here's my favorite uh dave weckle liquor here's my favorite carmen apathy liquor what you know whatever um I, we've got so many of those videos we don't need to have another one like that so the guy that i was working with at the time he's he he said well why don't we focus on this on what you're thinking is behind the uh, um, in your face and interactive which essentially the whole premise behind that thing is <clears throat> I really felt that people should be inspired to play music because it was fun. That yeah, was, yeah, yeah. that was my whole, the whole idea behind it. And, uh, you know, I took, took to the stage. I had three sets of drums. I had the, the big set like I had at Montreal drum fest, I yep. had a little, uh, Remo junior pro. And then <laughs> I had a standard, like a standard four piece Pearl kit. And, uh, okay. and, and, and we also had uh, a Volkswagen rabbit that we, uh, that we cut in half. And that we pulled okay. and I would take someone from the audience and we would create music in the car. Right. So and, cool. Uh, I need to check that out. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so the whole idea behind that and, and ironically at, at that time in my life, it was also a time that I was doing a lot of stuff with Dom Pangalaro. So Dom was kind enough to really put the push on that for me. Um, but, but the idea was that I felt that people should be inspired to play music because music was fun more than we needed another video about how to play drums. I got and, it. Uh, so the so the guy that I was working with, the 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 director of film and stuff like that, he's the one that came up, across and said, you know what? I think that this other thing that you're doing is really worthwhile looking at, and I think we should focus in that direction. So, you know, that's the direction we went in. It's just as good because it, it's so true what you just said. I was talking with one drummer, a friend of mine from Montreal, Mario Roy, and he did a drum a DVD. He's a sonar artist and Sabian, and he record a full drum dvd like around four or five years ago and we're talking about that how, how and it's not easy because there's different shots uh, you need to bring your ideas you need to be different you need to and in this video it was a good example of that he created a lot of things uh pattern weird like samba and pipe force but like really uh, articulated with odd meters and it's nothing comparable with someone else so I, I, I and it's hard to find out i have the same issue i have it there but i have my drum book i wrote in 2012 um and uh, when i came out with it how many books we can find in the market but i wanted a cookbook with everything in it so it's hard to bring those ideas but i always encourage kids or people to write even if it's a song uh a, re a patterns that make your brain work in and in that make you realizing what you are doing like the same when you sing your pattern if you can sing i always say what you're playing is going to be better and you're going to be able to play it in a in a easiest way because uh, you can your brain uh, absorb the rhythm and your body too so, absolutely so well uh, but it's cool i'm gonna check your dvd for sure and uh, your documentary i'm gonna go look at it well, uh, it's, it's an old one so it, it, it would be hard to find oh, okay I, I mean one of the things that i'm enjoying right now is is the, the availability of instruction uh, sometimes you have to dig a little bit for it but yep. i mean just with with youtube being the way it is i mean i can if i want to i can spend a whole day studying what you do i can spend a whole day studying what larnell lewis does i can spend exactly. a whole day uh you know, looking at uh, David Garibaldi. Uh, but the, the cool thing is, is that every time I go to YouTube and I, and I go to that list, so say I want to go and, I, and I'm going to think, uh, who am I going to look at today? Uh, okay, I'm going to look at Tony Williams. Uh, well, in the sidebar, there's all these other drummers that start showing up and a lot of them that I know, but then there's a lot that I don't know. And, yes. and, I, and I look at them and <clears throat> there's so many people out there with such great ideas. The, the, um, what year were you born? I'm sorry, I shouldn't ask that, but... Oh, I'm born in, in Quebec, province of Quebec, in uh, the city of Alma, but it's a very, very little town. So, is it... what, what year? Uh, 1978. So, 78. So, you're, you're, you still remember when finding things uh, was like finding gold. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, like, with, like before, before YouTube and everything else. I, we had, I had to wait. For, well, I have to for, wait too. <laughs> you know, I had to wait for for uh, for you know like to see someone like Gary, David Garibaldi. I had to wait till our Tower of Power came here, or I had oh, to sure. travel somewhere to go see him. I remember going to Montreal in 19, uh, 1979 to uh, the Spectrum to see uh, yeah. Jack and Jeanette. Uh, wow. But but the only way I was going to see Jack and Jeanette is if I went there to to see him, right? So uh, you know, very often, I, if you could find. Uh, I think I might have one on VHS somewhere. And if I yeah. have it, I'll send it to you. Can't be cool. Or, or, put, or there's converter now. There's converter. You can, you could 
transfer that in MP4 and put in your website and people can pay or whatever you want to do with it. It's kind of good access to it now. There is a good idea. I think I'll, the, I'll uh, follow through. I, that, by the way, because I lost you one second, the internet cut for one second. Can you repeat the last word? We we lost you for a second. Oh, I was saying I was saying that that's a really good idea, and I and I I didn't even dawn on me that I should be doing that. I think yeah. possibly because that was something that I did so long ago that you know I think I've, I'd like to think that I've evolved beyond that now. Uh, well, but the past is still the past, so we we still have stuff that make us. So sometimes can be good access to uh, what you've done for some kids or for people they would like to to know more about you. Uh, we are almost done. Uh, what's gonna uh, What's next with your uh, your band? Uh, all your project, I mean, in general, because I know the questions are means have project, but in general, I know COVID changed stuff. But uh, when are your new your next tour possibly and things like that? How it look like? Well, I mean, depending on what happens with with COVID, of course, uh, we have we have a tour through the United States that's that's booked right now for March, but that might not come to pass depending on what what happening with with the world. Uh, we have another one booked in Europe in in um, uh, starting. I think most of it is in Germany, uh, but that's starting in May. That's okay. a possibility that that'll still happen. I, it kind of depends what happens with uh, with vaccines and all that kind of no. stuff, um, and then. If the world, you know, goes right again, I'm pretty sure that we're we're going to cover the world over the next two years, the uh, next three years or so. Uh, yeah. In between that, I, I I spend a lot of time here at home. I have a studio downstairs, and I work on soundtracks for movies and stuff like that. So I, I'm 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 busy all the time, and I'm trying to be as creative as possible. And as I said earlier, uh, lately I've, I've had some people that have been sending me a lot of stuff that they want me to record at home. And I'm sending them tracks too, which is which is uh, which is really great. And, and as I said, not a lot of them have come back yet, so that means that whatever <laughs> I'm doing, I'm doing right. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, well, but it's a good point you just said. You're doing your things in your house, uh, in house. I mean, like uh, because some people they're like, oh, I'm not sure how I can manage that. But now, in in with technology, you can even go online. Buy uh, like or your local store. I, I actually always recommend to go to local store. You can buy a cheap drum kit, electronic, very cheap if you don't have access to a studio like you have. And with plugins now, you can record and be creative and have and have projects. You don't need to have a studio outside. With of course, it's nicer the real kit. But right now, with that situation, everybody can have access to a a, a way for recording. I guess. Yeah, it'd be perfect. I mean, how much space do you have there in your condominium in in, uh, in Mexico? Now I have like a, a practice kit right there. Uh, it's very small, but I can set up my drums. Uh, I have a bebop kit. Uh, like I'm, I'm a 12, uh, is it 12, 18, 14. I have a couple of snare, a few cymbals. So I can set up a bebop set for practice, but my real home studio, like for recording, is about 15 minutes from here. So uh, I need to drive. <laughs> and and uh, to have a lot of Un poquito, sí. Pues, oh, eh, wow. Esto perfecto, pero como 40%, más o menos. Oh, wow. Ok, vous parlez français, vous parlez anglais, vous parlez uh, en, español. En, en español. Portuguese, sí. peut-être, no? No, no. The, uh, I can understand, but I cannot talk. I will practice that, but now with new project we have with Jean-Phil Café. Uh, whoa, whoa, you have uh, some uh, some issue with uh, <laughs> with wrong stuff in yeah. that he wanted the stage hey man it's over thanks you're a very cool person very kind for your time i really appreciate that uh it sucks when i was in winnipeg we couldn't share time i've been there like two times three months around two months and a half in the past years um but next time i will be in winnipeg uh, let's have a, a chat or if you come here or in montreal when i'm going to be back there we can have a chat too in person i say uh never mind the chat let's have a, a breakfast and a tequila yeah oh yeah for sure i will bring you a bottle <laughs> they're they're cheap here so uh, i can uh, always bring a couple with me so uh i'm a big okay, fan well, well, hey uh, it's a uh, uh, grand merci uh muchas gracias and uh, <laughs> we'll see you next time see you next time see you take care bye, bye, -bye. hi everybody um uh, just a little reminder, please, if you have time, go check out the website. Uh, if you didn't know, we have a website running. It's uh, www.drumfieldscafe.com. Million of information there. Uh, we have a French show and we have a Spanish show. So you can always check those. Uh, we have other surprises if you didn't know. So I suggest you to go look at it. 
another thing, if you didn't know, we are in the third season. So that's mean there's two seasons before. So go look at them. Go watch those videos. Uh, you can have access to podcasts of those videos if you don't want to watch them. Um, we have a lot of information going through that platform. So most of them go through Facebook or through the website. We have our Instagram and you, our YouTube running. Uh, they're more like reminder, but you can always go check that out there too. And um, and one more point, we're in April now. So we are we are at the end of the, the season, actually. It's uh, the last show of uh of our season next season will be crazy the fourth season will start september four uh four or five around that so um it might change but it's going to be around that the, the, the for the fourth season go check it out and um if you don't know uh the artists or who's coming the best place still facebook or the dot com that will be those platform for let you know who's coming for the fourth season so let's go see our last art, last artist of the day. Uh, he played a lot of drum clinics. I've seen. I just told him. I saw a few videos of him. It was pretty cool. Uh, he's a Canadian multi instrumentist. He's the drummer from Protest the Rio, Mister uh, Mister Weekend, sorry, Saint Fear. Uh, he's a Zildjian, Mapex, Evans, Pro Mark, Neuro DSP, and V Rhythm and Dorsey. Let's say hi to my friend Michael Leredy. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm very happy. Actually, it's cool because we chat like around 15 minutes before the show. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah it's great. <laughs> so actually, it's cool. I think uh, I like it. Um, I, thanks for being on the show. And um, and it's cool to have a guy like you because uh, you're a Canadian and uh, not because you can be whatever other in the, in the planet, but I'm Canadian. I'm just I'm very happy about, about that. And you play music for no name no name bands i mean uh, protest zero is a pretty good name band and you tour with them for a long time now you, you told me around seven years you would you you are with yes. protest zero. seven or eight years eight years now um now that we're in 2021 um i came in just on volition uh okay. just before that record came out ish uh and yeah we have uh we have played a lot of shows. <laughs> yeah, actually, just just to mention, the uh, those albums you've done are amazing. I, oh, I, thank I you. yeah, I have them in my playlist. You know, like normal playlist. You know, like when some random song pass, and uh, I suggest to the like everybody to go look at to go look at them or listen to them. It's pretty cool. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah, look, you're just talking about shows. Um, how many big tours did you do? Uh, like once a year, like a big tour, like I mean, or like it's every two years. How you work that? Oh, out? like. 10 months out of the year so probably like five six tours big tours a year um for i mean pretty much up until covid pretty much yeah. um so it was uh it was a lot um we're very lucky that the band um has been our job for so long so okay. um <clears throat> we just spend like most bands who uh who are performers for a living um you know all about this you just spend mm -hmm. all the time on on the road so when volition first came out it was uh it was very very heavy touring um because mm -hmm. it was the beginning of a record cycle and then we kind of slowed down to do uh pacific myth but due to the release of that like how it was done um we did like a song a month. So we, when that was all wrapped up, we did tours off of that. And then uh, we started a bit more of a break to, to work on Palimpsest. So that was our, um, and then we, we had plans to tour, but yeah, here we are. So like, you're going to be back. Else. You're going to be back. Yeah. No worry. Usually you're, you are like a tour bus kind of rock and roll style or you're like, uh, it depends of the gig. Uh, it depends. Yeah. Um, buses are obviously great um, for, safety and comfort um True. Uh, safety being the big one <laughs> um yeah <laughs> and uh but like we don't like if it, it, they're expensive right so mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah if you want to uh do a tour and and tour in a van instead and you you can it can be a lot more profitable for you know really not that big of a lack of comfort outside of sleeping but it, it just depends on the tour so if we're doing like six seven weeks then we'll get a bus because that six seven weeks turns into 
what feels long like run. months if you're in yeah. a band. Um, but if it's something smaller, a uh, couple weeks or whatever, then we, we usually won't get a bus because it's kind of a waste of money. Uh, uh, the, those famous Ford Econo line with a trailer. It's the one. It's the one. Yeah, yeah. We uh, drove ours into the ground, and uh, right. we don't have one now. But uh, we would, you know, we would did that, or actually bandwagons because we're in Canada and the U.S. Uh -huh. Right. So they're they're great. We we use those a couple times, and I mean, the only real difference is is the divider between this the the bunk section. But we're lucky to have that option in North America. Like it's, it, it is substantially cheaper and it's quite comfortable. Suspension is a little rocky, but it's good. <laughs> <laughs> it reminded me long time ago, like in, I think 2000 or 99, I was in a production company. Mm -hmm. We're uh, producing a punk rock show. And um, we had that day, I think it was Lagwagon, Propagandy, uh, sure. SNFU, a few, a few good bands. Yeah. And, uh, but Lagwagon, they're coming from, California, Los Angeles, like, I mean, so, like really Southern, like I think they're based uh, around Irvine. So imagine, so, so they arrived in November, snowstorm, Canadian snowstorm, you know, like, like uh, summer tires, uh, nothing. Yeah. I remember we we're pushing the truck, like 20 guys at the end of the show, <laughs> shoveling everything. They That's were like, what's scary. going on here? <laughs> yeah, that is, uh, winter touring is, is a reason for me never to tour again because it's not, not for cold not for this it's it's strictly for your safety like it is oh, yeah. it's a scary thing like everyone's heard stories or been in situations it's uh yeah it's i don't know oh, it's something yeah. that a lot of people don't really a lot of people uh, like talk uh, sorry a lot of people ask questions when i do clinics about touring and i kind of try and touch on these topics where i'm like I'm like bands don't always stop touring because they're gone all the time or it's tiring or whatever. It's like, it's like a big, big part of it is your safety. It's like, it, imagine going oh. to sleep every night, even in a bus and having this much oh. between you and a car. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's uh, it, it weighs on you for sure. So, so, and when you do those tour, I guess you are carrying your kit, but when you go overseas, you'll go back line kind of thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Usually, uh, Almost everywhere, Mapex can supply uh, a backline kit, which is amazing, and they're always great. So anything yep. in Europe, it's great. Uh, Japan is great. They, I don't know how much support they have in Australia, or um, I had to play a couple other things in Southeast Asia and Russia. Those were two other locations that they were kind of like, we just don't have that much support there, so play what you play. So it was fine, but I, I don't care. You put me on pots and pans. But do you bring your own symbols and pedal or like yeah, a, yeah like, all your breakables so usually my snare symbols pedals and after that i'm fine i don't yeah. uh, everything else is completely workable but anyway you you don't use a big setup i was checking your videos like four piece four piece set mostly yeah, yeah it's pretty standard uh, i used to have two splash symbols in front of me um i dropped those just no real reason just ended up not using them as much um i actually just put a little stack back up but uh yeah but i haven't played any shows with it but it's just it's like the most it's like your uh your image on long and mcquade or you know like it's it's yeah. two, two crash symbols ride symbol hi-hat hi like it's your standard kit so but uh i, I and actually I've, i was seeing you you to work with your computer are you the kind of person you will put the full session and without the drums or you are you going to have like a, a beta version like with less stuff and you can play around when you do drum clinics oh uh, so for drum clinics uh -huh. i just what i do is take our stems and okay. do a mix of everything but drums because as much as people are there for drums drums on their own can be boring when it's not when it's like like I'm playing rock or metal songs, right? Here's your verse, here's your chorus and ball. So like when those parts come up without any backing, it's mm -hmm. it's me playing halftime or you're hearing the same beats because it's sections of an actual song. So if they're not going to, like I want people to hear everything. Um, actually, D Dave, my rep, who's been with me for years and years, um, he was even suggesting putting in um, vocals because mm -hmm. why not, right? Like it's, Yeah, for sure it's more fun for people. I have the stems, uh, but instrumental is fine because there's so much guitar work in our band that it kind of takes, takes that space. Uh, but if you were to do, you know, like, uh, 
I'm going to say proper drum clinic where you're, you're like really shedding hard and then you don't need anything, but because I'm generally playing songs from our band, I try to put some backing in there. But yeah, but something you just mentioned uh, about, like you said, we can add vocals. Something I realized I like about Protest de Rio, de Rio is like the, the way you play, even if it's fast or if it's odd meters or if technical, it's always musical. And it's hard in that kind of style, you know what I mean? So it's fast, it's like a lot of sections, but you are always, not just you, I mean, the band is yes. very musical in general. In the, is, I, I like it. That's why I think you are one of those bands we can put in the radio or in the car and go from the first song to the end. Oh, you know? that's great. I, I'm happy to hear that. We, we, did, we did really try and focus on that uh, for Palimpsest, our latest record, mm -hmm. um, because... I think it's just the way we we write. We write all the music first, and then we give okay. it to Brody, our singer, and then we kind of leave the poor guy with like, "Here's what you need to write music to or vocals to," and it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. Uh -huh. There's different time signatures everywhere. There's polyrhythms everywhere, and like I can't even. I don't know how the guy's done it for so many years. But with this record, we tried to write everything, and um, before putting leads everywhere uh, or really messing with the time signatures. We want to see what he can come up with first. So here's your sections. If he decides not to write over a section where we maybe thought that there would be vocals, we can ha fly in a lead and write mm -hmm. some parts for it and do that after. Um, because yeah, we would just give him, if you listen to some of the other records, like the chorus has leads everywhere and crazy drums and all this stuff. And like, he's trying to, he's such a good writer. So it's like, yep. like give the guy some space. And, and to be honest, it worked great. Like he, he was like thrilled about it, that he had all this room and he delivered. So I, uh, hat goes off to that guy. Um, I, I, I have like a hundred other projects with him. So it's like, we've learned a lot about how we write together and, um, this is important. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. You can just kind of see, him and I have like a skate punk band together. And in that band, we, it's not technical at all. It's fast. Sure. But like, here's your chord progression and like maybe a tiny lick here and there, nothing crazy. And to hear how he writes over it. When we started writing Palimpsest, it was like, I'm like, I know that he's going to crush these parts. Right. So you, you just you get this, like, I don't know. It was cool. It was fun. So you have a lot of room. Right. As yeah. a drummer. Yes. Yeah. And so what I try and do, I write a lot of guitar. Um, so drums are kind of in like order of importance from for music because vocals are always going to be the most important um it's it's like guitar first mm -hmm. then drums for me sit after and as much as we are a technical band i don't want to soak up all the room showing what i can do right yeah, like yeah there's bands out there who who are instrumental Mm -hmm. um animals as leaders is always yep. my example for this right yep. matt gartska is is unbelievable at drums yep. the, the whole band is unbelievable but he is like like really 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 incredible and in my like the way i kind of see it is like if you want to hear somebody just go wild over music listen to animals as leaders they're amazing <laughs> like they do such it's a true. good job for us we have a vocalist and i think that that is ultimately what people are are more interested in and it's what we are more interested in right like that's the music we listen to more often so i think was a good comment for the young blood or kids um listening to that interview because you're talking about recording uh tricks like to be musical and all um i, I want to approach one thing for example you are a kind of band like a, 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 are you using a lot of trigger or like are you computerizing a lot or how no. you manage that because i want the, the kids understand how you your work in those uh mix because it's sometimes some kids will listen to a band on the radio and it's like that's amazing but when they try to play the song they sounds like not really good you know in person and they have so many process so many things so how you work that out on your site so you you mean for the records themselves for the record itself yeah for right. what it sounds yes yeah, so i mean i don't really know what the what the engineer does at the end of the day with the mix right because we're not yeah. watching them like a hawk um on our last record i can speak to that uh we were pretty for drums i was pretty heavy-handed in saying like as little as sample mixed in as possible 
Okay. So we went to a really nice studio. We took a lot of times on the drum tones and it sounds really good. Uh, Simon, the guy who he plays for a band called Pliny, um, he mixed it and he is very much about organic sound. So he's just, he's just really good at mixing. So he did a really, really good job. Uh, but no, there's not, um, we try and do our very best to be as real as possible. Okay. Um, like obviously we're doing takes and we're okay. comping things together, right? Oh, like sure. any other album. Um, but yeah, that's like, like I, I don't think we would do a live off the floor record because it's not the style of music that we play. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we do try and make it um, as as real and organic as possible. Um, I don't, I don't think I play anything that I would ever need triggers for live, right? Like we, we we're not fast enough. Like I completely, completely understand why people in like death metal bands use triggers, right? Because hey, you want somebody to play two hundred and sixty beats so per fast. minute. Mm -hmm. like yeah get some triggers in there or else it's it's just not going to sound good like it's like there's a certain element that, you want that will be missing and in my mind uh, as we talked right. earlier before the show about shannon lucas mm -hmm. who triggers like he's doing it if he makes if you're using triggers and you make the smallest error it's loud and clear you have to be perfect Tight. oh yeah and he is perfect <laughs> he <laughs> never makes a mistake it is crazy <laughs> it's uh, it's hard just good point huh? practicing with uh with with triggers some people are like oh it's easy the sound is it's easy it's only triggers that it's go through a computer oh it's not like that it works there's like a you know like the way you eat if it sounds like odd, you will have in your face. It's like a juggler juggling, and if a ball fall, you will you will see what's going on on That's stage. It. It's and it's funny. I think people. Uh, I'm going to assume here, but I find people think triggers are something different than what they yeah. actually are. Like it's just a sound replacement. So exactly. the only thing that you're getting out of it is velocity, right? Mm -hmm. So like, I mean, I'm sure there's ways to mimic things, but I, I, barring that. Mm -hmm. It is is a velocity like it is a, is a, a MIDI audio that's going out to front of house. And if you jack up your velocity on that, cool, do it. I don't care because if you make a mistake, if you're off your meter, if you are like a little bouncy that night, it's loud and clear. You, it's it is like every error comes out. So yeah, it's, yeah. For yes, yeah, sure, you may you may be able to play softer and it sounds loud, but it doesn't sound tight if you're off right so you have to be very aware of these things like probably. so yeah for, for anyone who's watching who thinks triggers make or like this magic thing it's like it's actually probably the opposite like it really <laughs> highlights exactly how you're playing something it's true it's yeah. funny because I, I remember a long time ago i saw machine head uh you know, live and I, I was i don't know i was maybe 16 or 17 yeah. that yeah. was trigger in my face crazy yeah i bet and there's a way to mix it that it doesn't sound like that. And I think also the sound libraries have come so far mm -hmm. that before it was like a MIDI kick drum, like a very, it's, it was a like very electronic sounding thing that was mimicked to be real, where now mm -hmm. you can load in something from like get good drums or slate drums or whatever you want. Yes. And yeah. that's your trigger. And then it sounds amazing. So it's, 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 yeah, there's a lot more, a lot more room for how, how it sounds now. And um, talking about you have your, your that band, let's talk about the other project you have. Uh, you just mentioned you were playing like skateboard punk kind of band. Do are you do you have another project? It's completely the opposite of what you are doing. Like in and the kind of you are more like in that uh, range of hardcore metal punk or stuff like that. Um, they're all kind of still heavy. So mm -hmm. uh, mystery weekend is myself. Rody, the singer of Protest, and then uh, our friend Dan Hay from a okay. band called Amos the Transparent, uh, which is actually a really great folk band, uh, but he grew up on punk rock. Uh, if you remember the band Fully Down from Ottawa yep. years yep, yep. ago, that he played guitar in that band. Okay. Um, we really like skate punk, and Dan's like my best bud. So we started writing, and I was like, Rody, you want to sing skate punk? And he was like, of course. <laughs> and so if we, we started that project a few years ago. Um, super fun. Very low bar in terms of like there's no plan it's just for fun it's just for us uh we're glad people like it but we're not writing music 
like we're writing music that we want to hear period mm -hmm. with no, like we don't care if it's too much of a or not enough B it's just, it's, it's exactly what we want to hear. And then I have a project called same fears. Uh, yeah, that yeah, is a hard, more hardcore ish band. Um, and that's all just me. So I play guitar, bass, drums, and I'm the vocalist as well. And that band is just really, again, same idea for fun, but all of the money from that band that gets generated um, is donated to the Canadian Mental Health Association. Oh, whoa. Uh, and then some other um, associations that I would like to donate to. So it's it's more of a passion project musically and also, I guess, financially, although it's not a lot of money that really comes in. But I have had a lot of support with it, which I appreciate. And it's been able to let me make donations to causes that I think are important uh, while letting me scream in my basement. So, you know, my fiance <laughs> really loves that, but you know. <laughs> but it's a good cause. It's a, it's a good idea to do that, I guess. Thank you. And uh, it's it's hard because it, as a band, um, you have to believe in something you, you, you want to contribute to, you know. It's not like, okay, we'll do that for be cool. And you have to believe in the project, you know. That's it, yeah. And that project to me is, probably means the most because probably half because it's going towards a good cause and the other half because it's like my project where I do everything and make every decision. So obviously I'm going to like it, right? Like that's like, yeah, know, yeah, I'm kind of feeding sure. my own ego that way. But um, it is, uh, it is a project that I, that I really enjoy. Um, we've only ever played one show with it. Same idea. Everything was donated, but it was, it was very weird to be the <laughs> singer. Yeah, I've never done that before. So um, that's hard. Uh, do you, are you, are you able to sing and playing drums? No, so I wasn't playing drums. I no, no, was, no, I'm just asking. Okay, yeah, yeah, I can. I, in my first band, I did just like harmonies and and screams or whatever. Uh, but I didn't. I it's. Do you know the band Opeth? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so uh, Michael Ackerfeld is in another band called Bloodbath that I really love. And I kind of not to compare myself to Michael Ackerfeld because he's amazing, but I kind of felt like him. If you've ever seen a live video of Bloodbath, okay, where I didn't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> <laughs> and every time I watch Bloodbath videos, he's like, he has this weird stance because he always has a guitar. So yeah, he's yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I, I just when I would look at photos from that show, I was like, <laughs> like I don't know, I've always played drums. So it's it's hard because I remember. Like um, in my when I was 16, 17 years old, I was touring. I, I did a tour uh, with the um, uh, Refuse, Snapcase, oh, and, oh, and, Snapcase and so yeah, sick. and uh, Satanic Surfer, oh, and, Rod and Rodrigo, the drummer. Yeah. Now he's, he has a drummer and he sings. Yeah. Sometimes he do some shows, he's drumming, but sometimes he's only going to be a singer. But I remember first time with I was the opening band, but I remember when I've seen him the first time, not the most technical guy, but so great punk drummer. Like, I mean, yeah. in your face totally. And he sing perfect. And it's, it's on pitch. Nothing moved. Yeah, I try. Forget it. I cannot. <laughs> it's hard. It is hard. And like, it, you don't have to even be playing something technical for that to be difficult. Like, it's it's just hard. <laughs> it's super hard. Yeah. And um, just talking about that, do you have some advices for the people there who they want to play like fast um, fast music like that because you do have some uh, stretching some technical so some, some warm up because you can hurt your muscle you can like you can whatever. and I have yeah oh, yeah okay yeah I had a we did a tour with our friends band August Burns Red and it was long, oh, yeah. It was great a long tour. yeah they're awesome mm -hmm. um, and the last like two and a half weeks of that tour I had a muscle issue with like the front part of my calf like or okay. sorry the front part of my like shin the right outer muscles or right and left outer muscles um and it was actually from exhaustion but it's because before that tour i had brought the the spring tension on my pedals really far down because okay. i wanted to play some fast fast stuff or whatever and then got comfortable and forgot to change it but protest isn't that fast like not that fast that right fast. so um i need a lot more of the rebound from the springs and I just forgot and was playing and then I was skateboarding on that tour and I guess everything combined, I, I couldn't even play like a four on the floor rock beat without it hurting. And we did two weeks of that and I, I, I couldn't wait for that tour to be over. And then I had to go for like kind of rehabilitation on it, whatever. It was awful. So yeah, um, that stuff is, that's the only thing that's ever really happened to me in terms of, um, but it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot. It was very scary. And also like, quite embarrassing when you're playing live and you you know you're not on and you know you're like you're just like i can't do anything about this i can't stop and i 
I can't like, there's only two weeks left. So every night I was hoping I was like on the internet trying to like figure out what was going on. And then it was only until I saw a professional that they were like, you actually, I had to like learn how to walk different for a period. Oh, of yeah, for it, sure. It was strange. Yeah. Anyways, but, um, no, but for people learning, important. yeah, it really, really is. Um, I say for people who want to learn to play quick, uh, I know I sound like every teacher ever, but start slow. Mm -hmm. It really is the the only way. Um, and, and you need to like, you really need to learn your note values. I feel that that is the most important thing if you want to start to play fast. So what does a 16th note sound like at 180 beats per minute? Or what does a 16th note triplet sound like at 180 beats per minute, whatever you, tempo you want. But mm -hmm. a really good technique, I taught drums for many, many years. And the, the thing that when people would want to play fast is I would always say, start, depending on your tempo, but let's just say start, go eighth notes with your hands or your feet, eighth note triplet, 16th note, 16th note triplet, 16th notes, eighth note triplets and eighth notes up and down and up and down and, and change your tempo and do it to a click. And I know it sounds boring and sometimes it is, but it is, it is truly important because then you know what, when, so let's say you're playing and you're playing 16th notes and you want to bump it up to that next level, you know what it's supposed to sound like. And that's Probably. something I think a lot of people kind of forget. They just think like, I'm going to, when you're when you're first starting i'm just gonna go as fast as i can it's like you need a note value to stick that to like like properly when you hear um the bands like the black dahlia murder or nile it's like mm -hmm. it just sounds like he's going as fast as you can if you don't know notation but it's like there's obviously exactly like a, a, a his notes that he's playing right so it's like it's important to lock that in Probably. when you're learning when you start so that you can be like okay i've practiced this tempo at this at 16th notes, now I'm going to try 16th note triplets. Like not everything is six is 30 second notes. Almost never, really. Like it's it's usually a high tempo with 16 notes or 16 notes triplets. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's. I mean, obviously, there's lots of 30 second notes, but generally speaking, what most people are playing are 16th notes. When you hear something like this, really, like wow. <laughs> no, no, um, man, it's good. It's good advice because. Uh, so many people are showed up with a double bass drum and they're like, uh, "Let's go! I want to play the fastest as I can." But okay, whoa. Let's let's work some groove and let's let's put some stuff down and after yep. that you're gonna build up and it's gonna go at the, at the place it should be you know because and, and if you try to be there without make the effort sometime in that space it won't be that good at the top you know and that's it and you're just it's gonna get jumbly and it's gonna exactly. you really need to know exactly what you're after and uh, it's the same thing for polyrhythms I I always give the same advice learn what it sounds like mm -hmm. learn what your right hand sounds like versus your left hand at what at whatever polyrhythm that you're working on right so even as simple as like let's say you're doing like seven over four like learn what that let's say a seven stroke roll or five stroke roll a really good one that um i used to always do is just do five seven nine uh yeah. and eleven and then work my way back down same idea as the speed thing but just learning how all of that sounds over four right so just stomp your foot or have a click more realistically um mm -hmm. and learn what that actually sounds like and and watch your hands because yes it's notation yes drums are math yes all that stuff but like it comes down to how it sounds right learn what each of these polyrhythms like where does your downbeat fall when you're doing seven stroke roll over four, what exactly does that sound like? Where is your one every single time, right? So once you learn how it sounds, then you can orchestrate it properly around your kit. You can use it in fills and you can use it wherever. You don't have to count, you don't have to do this. You just know this is supposed to sound like this. And mm -hmm. that's how I've, I kind of teach both things. It's like, take your time, do it slow, mm -hmm. learn how it feels, learn how it sounds and there's no rush you'll get there probably a lot faster than you think if you just put in a little bit of labor at the start so totally i it's done the time is over oh, we're wow. running out of time okay. <laughs> time flies. yeah well thanks for your advisors i wish you all the best uh where the people can follow you where like is it instagram or facebook where's your uh... Uh, i don't have facebook but uh instagram is at amirati so at m i e r a d i and then uh, Twitter, I started using it again. It's more for like tech 
Apple-y software-y stuff. Uh, that's just at Michael Arati. Same same idea. So that's it. Well, yeah. I, thanks for your time. Uh, I wish you good luck with the drum fest for uh, because you're gonna be in part of the Quebec drum fest. Uh, hopefully, if, if it happens, goes, if it yeah, happens yeah. because of COVID. But uh, if yes, I I suggest the people to go uh, look at it, and you're gonna be on it. Um, do you have any things coming out you would like to talk to to let you know before you go? Like new album, something go, going out soon? Or? I, I would say check out our last release, uh, Palimpsest. It came okay. out uh, just last year. It's our first full length in a while. Okay. Uh, all streaming platforms, so forth and so on. Uh, and we'll have some like fun things coming out soon, but uh, like, yeah, I would say just our newest record. It's it's not even a year old yet, so it's pretty pretty new still. Pretty easy. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I wish Thanks you a, a, a good night and uh, stay safe. Yeah, you as well, please. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks to Michael already to be part of Drum Field Cafe. I would like to say, Thank you to be part of the third season, everybody. Uh, it was a blast. Uh, we had a lot of good artists. I suggest you to go on the drumfieldcafe.com to go check that out, all the artists we had. Um, keep in touch with us. The next season is starting. It will start like around 4 or 5 of September. It might change a little bit, but uh, look around that time. You're going to have all the information about the fourth season. And thanks again to be part of uh, Drumfield Cafe. It's because of you we're there. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.